Good morning. I bear greetings from Redemption Point, as Pastor Bill said. We uh, start moving uh, into the pavilion in about July, and it was gracious that Pastor Bill and the church hosting us. Uh, before that, we were down in Coastal Community uh, Fellowship and for about 12 years, and recently they just have too many church meetings there, so we're looking for another location. And this is actually much, much more convenient for us because, believe it or not, I live right across the street. So <laughs> you, you walk across from Magnolia, I mean, like to the other, you know, block right there. This morning after the service, a bunch of people come in, yeah, I live down the street from you, you know, I'm right at the park. Uh, McDowell Park right there, so it was great to be here. But I know that a lot of you probably are going to ask the question of, oh, what sort of pastor with the name Bumbo, you know, who can take him seriously, right? <laughs> right so so uh, honestly, that actually a made-up name. You know, my, my Vietnamese name is Ngip. Now, I dare you to pronounce that. It's like impossible to pronounce, right? So... Many years ago, when I started working with junior high in our church, and they started asking me about, you know, what's your name? So I said, well, you know, my nickname is, um, my mom called me B, so you can call me B. B is actually like marble in Vietnamese, so because my eyes probably round or something, right? And they said, so B, like bumblebee? I said, yeah, so, so bumblebee is good. So they start calling me bumblebee. And then eventually, they cut it short into bumble. And then about 20 years ago, some of them say, well, can we even cut it shorter to bum? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 let's not do bum, because if you do bum, eventually you cut it short again, become B, and the whole cycle will start again. <laughs> I thought that was a weird name, right? Until a few years ago, Hollywood actually make a movie about my life. <laughs> but just like, you know, the aliens coming to Earth, I'm still really not adjusting with the American language very much, so if I speak today and my grammar came out whack or something, you know, my wife always say, eh, that's not properly grammar. Uh, forgive me and just bear with me. So today I'm really glad to be here um, to uh, continue the series of um, Behold Your King. And Pastor Bill was really nice and allowed me to have this middle section of the Magi. Because if he put me to preach last week on the genealogy, I think I would die. I think AJA did a much, much better job, right? And then if next week, uh, if I have to speak on you know, the bloody massacre, you know, with Herod, that's going to be so hard too. But I'm really, really glad that this is something that I can handle. So we are going to be in Matthew chapter 2 today, verse uh, 1 to 12, the story of the uh, Magi worshiping the king, and in a way, this is kind of the core of the message of beholding the king. Because if you remember what Pastor Bill said last week, beholding is not just look, but look attentively with wonder, amazement, and be able to see and take in awe of this really, really wonderful, beautiful thing of our king. And it's almost like uh, in this week's staff meeting, when we were in the staff meeting together with Bill and Mitch, and Mitch was basically just start reading the lyric of the song that you just heard. And I was like, wow, the lyric was so wonderful. I couldn't wait until we were to see this. And you know, hearing the song was just like mind-blowing. So I think we were going to come through this passage the same way in this passage. If you read together with me, we'll see the word worship starting about three times, and that will be the core of the message today. So would you uh, read together with me? I have the, you know, the word on the screen here, so let us read together as the church together, but the word of God, okay? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. 
but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the ruler of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them that that time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship with him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they have seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for us today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who illuminate the word of God. I pray that you will also open up our heart so that we would also come and behold your king today. Not only with our words, singing, but also with our life and devotion, O Lord God. Transform our heart for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today I have actually two points only. Uh, the first one is uh, we worship because we were created to do so. And then the second point, a little bit more practical, is how we go about beholding our king and our worship, right? So first of all, we worship because we were created to do so. Now this passage, very familiar passage for all of you every Christmas, we begin to see this is the first time the New Testament recorded someone to worship Jesus as the king of the Messiah. And lo and behold, these people, the first time, the first people who come and worship Jesus were not even Jew. Right? They were the Magi, you know, were the people who study like astrology, they study the education at the time, they observe the heaven, they see how that affecting on earth, and by their observation, they say, hey, you know, some phenomenon happened in heaven, right? And if you remember, it's like uh, every time that you have some sort of strange thing in the world, uh, CNN would, you know, will in all these you know, special doctors, scholars, explain what's going on. So these Magi have the same kind of position in, you know, the government at that time. But they were about 1,000 miles east of um, Jerusalem. So these people say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we see this phenomenon. And according to our interpretation, everything has looked like, looked like a king, a, a newborn king come from the Jewish people. And we don't, the Bible didn't really give any sort of details about it. But what happened is these, this king was like special enough that somehow they were willing to make a thousand mile trip back then, probably about two months worth, you know, a caravan going all the way there. And it's like, wow, this is really, really strange. And then you begin to ask, wait a minute, these people in the, you know, in the East, they are not even Jewish people. They don't even not, you know, understand about the Bible. They have no idea. So what draw them to basically to make this trek up a thousand miles, right? But then I think if you take a look at the Bible, you begin to get some hint. Because I think the, the word worship that we see here in three times in this passage, in the English language, a lot of people say, well, worship, what does it mean, worship? You know, when we worship God, it's, worship is worth Ship, you attribute worth to God. So that's the way that usually we explain to people in English language, right? But in the Greek, it's actually different. The word in the Greek for worship is proskineo. And actually, it's a compound word of two things. Pros, like, you know, is actually like forward or toward, like leaning toward. And what's really interesting is the word skineo is a word a verb for kiss. A verb for kiss. So, so worship in the Greek language is mean, you know, you kind of you know, advance, you kind of moving forward, you lean forward to kiss. 
You know, so you have this kind of loving adoration, like, like you know, any of you guys like see a little baby and baby bee is too cute, you know, I cannot really hold on, you know, I have to kiss the baby, right? Right? So I think that's the kind of thing that I talk about worship, right? The really, really amazing is these scholars, they somehow, their studies say, this king is not any kind of ordinary king. Right? We, we love this king. We adore this king. But we are going to basically make an effort to go all the way for two months to go and worship this baby. Right? So one thing that I think we begin to see is people sometimes you know, have this really that drive. And some of them really drive really, really far. You know, a thousand miles basically do this. Because what the Bible said right, is these kings... What they do is they express that desire to worship in a practical way. But that desire, where that desire come from? Why would is that you know people have a longing or want to you know worship something? You know you don't even know the baby, right? you don't even never see them. What's going on there? Well, the Bible gives us a clue about the nature of the human heart. And in Ecclesiastic, it said that God had set eternity in the human heart. The human psyche, everybody that you meet, actually they have this innate desire to longing, to want to kiss something, to want to worship something. That's why like, even if Beach Point Church, we had like 10 different missionaries going to different parts of the world. No matter where you go, there will be a culture, and in the culture, they would have some sort of belief. They want to worship something, right? They have different religion, right? In the Vietnamese culture, you know, one of the major things that we have is we, um, they would worship Buddha. You know, some people worship their ancestor. You know, they believe that, you know, this would be the way that leads them to God. So this desire actually in people. St. Augustine said about this verse, and he said this. And one of the pastor paraphrased it. You probably heard it before. I said that our human heart had a God-shaped hole. So no matter what you're trying to fill it, it won't complete. So you always want something. So the same sort of thing with the people around you. Even if the people, you say, well, you know, they don't know God. They follow this God. They follow that God. That's just their innate desire. Just like the king, the magi. They actually say, well, we are going to, you know, looking at the star. We follow, yeah, this is the solution for the world. Let's come and, and worship that. And then people said, well, but then, you know, I also met my friend who actually not religious at all. You know, they don't really into any sort of religion. They just party, they just do whatever they want to do. Are they into their career or, you know, into Instagram or being, become a YouTuber, you know, being famous, you know, all this stuff. No, that's, that's, no. Where is that hole in the heart? Well, it also expressed in that way too, because no matter what happened, you know, even to those people, you would ask them, so why do you get this drive? You know, why do you work so hard for? Why do you have to achieve the success? Because that is actually the thing that they're longing, they're leaning to kiss. They really want to, because I think if I be able to have that relationship, if I be able to have that job, if I success in school, my life would be complete, right? So this is the desire and the design that God already put in our heart in that sense. So, it's a truth that even the American theologian Bob Dylan said, you're going to have to serve somebody. For those of you who don't remember who is Bob Dylan, even the songwriter, I know that the, the Beyonce, I think in 2009, also have a, you know, have a, I think a song now called Halo. And said, like, you are my halo. I see you like halo. And like, you, you would actually redeem me and you know, help me to basically get my life to have meaning. Same sort of thing. You put that sort of you know, desire into a person, an object, a belief that you have. And this is how we are why for this. Some people, like the Magi, maybe they're rich enough, wealthy enough, so they can afford this trip up 2,000 miles, right? A, a, a thousand miles. But then... Once they get there, we begin to see in the Bible is that these desires lead you so far, but not necessarily to the right place. So they begin to set out to go. And then, well, you know, 
If we're looking for a newborn king, it should be in Jerusalem. Go into Jerusalem, ask nobody heard about this newborn king. And in fact, you know, Herod kind of freaked out, right? And then Herod said, hey, you know, guys, biblical scholar, help me here. And then the biblical scholar said, wow, you know, we, the prophecy about the Messiah is actually in Bethlehem. So, guys, Magi, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and check it out? And then if it's true, you found, come back and let us know. So we will go there and worship too, right? Now, one of the things that it kind of catcher that we also recognize is this. It's not an accident that the first worshiper or the beholder of Jesus are the Chantai Magi. Back in the king's court, you have people who read the Bible, who understand the Bible, who know where the king is at, what, you know, where he will be born. But they miss out the opportunity to be able to behold the king. So let us not, you know, neglecting not only knowing the Bible, but acting out the Bible as well. So the point there that we begin to see is you would need the word of God in order to worship properly. Otherwise, if you just move by your feeling, oh, I feel that God wants me to do this, God wants me to do that, or this will be complete. Based on all that stuff, you might go wrong. This is why one of the um, founder of the biblical foundation, Andre uh, Kostenberger, he said that proper worship in any age is critically predicated upon the adequate and accurate knowledge of the God we are worship. This is why you and I are here today, we take a look at the word to see how are we supposed to worship God properly, right? Now, if not, you are going to basically fall into either, you know, irreligiously seeking fulfillment in, you know, in job and career and relationship and anything else, even party, pleasure, or are you also trying to seeking for uh, fulfillment through religious activities, you know, but none of that would lead you to the encounter with Jesus. Now, as we said, we need to basically base our worship on the Word of God and what the Word of God challenges us to do. I think we have an invitation for you from our church. They say, well, you know, come and worship together. Because I think if we read um, the Word, and even the song that Mitch was singing uh, allude to Ephesians 2, about people who are far and people who are near, God brings us together to worship, right? So one thing that we see in the Bible, in Revelation 7, for example, by the time that we'll be with God in heaven, the worship is going to be done with our tribes, our nation, our languages, right? But here today, it is still very, very hard for us to come together. We have different culture, different language, different barrier. And for example, I know that a lot of people mistaken us with the Vietnamese, Bap uh, Vietnamese Grace Church with Joseph, right? Because they said, yeah, so you are, congratulations, you are from that church. No, no, we actually, even we are Vietnamese. They speak more Vietnamese, we speak more English, we are younger, they are older, and we cannot even have the same service. It's hard. I'm not saying that it's easy, right? But then whenever we have the opportunity to come together, let's come together and celebrate and worship the way that God wants us to do, right? So that's the invitation now there. And yes, Pastor Bill is true. You know, my wife's making food every Sunday. So uh, if you come, you stay for dinner. <laughs> now... Second point that we have is now we begin to talk about how are we going to be whole our king and worship. This is actually in the next um, few verses uh, in 9 to 12. And when they begin to, you know, get the direction to Bethlehem, so they go and the Bible is clearly say, you know, exactly what did the Magi did in beholding the king in worship. The first one that we see here is in verse 11. They come into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bow down and worship him. So at first, when I first read this, I said, okay, they come and they worship. So, uh, but I, I begin to realize that this verse actually said that you must get down before you actually lifting your hand up and worship. So what do I mean by that? Remember that idea that we talk about worship, leaning forward? To kiss, right? But what the Bible said is that, no, you don't just go in 
and kissed the sun. No, it's not like that. I kind of wonder, why do you have to bow down before worship? And then I do a search in the Bible, and I realize that these words worship, you know, fall down before worship, they pair together all the time in the, in the New Testament. All the time. It's almost like you cannot worship if you don't bow down. And we see that in Revelation, didn't we, right? So when the elders, the 24 elders in Revelation, when they begin the throne of God, they will cast down their crown, they bow down, they fall down and worship, and that repeated over and over and over and over. That's a model for us, and I believe that it actually communicates this for us. In order for you to worship, you don't just turn on your worship, boom, I'm going to worship God. You have to get yourself into a right position, a right state in order to worship, right? A lot of you probably would know this. Um, if you are like me, you struggle a lot with, you know, reading the Bible and praying every day, you know. Um, it seems like, looks simple, but then it's very, very hard to do that. Super, super hard. Um, now, I keep trying every January 1st, I said, this year I'm going to read, you know, read my Bible and pray every day, right? And then I was like, you know, give up, do that multiple, multiple years, right? And then finally, somebody taught me this. The first step is not just wake up and read the Bible and pray. No. The first step is you have to decide. You have to decide that when are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? And prepare for it. Like for example, those of you who stay up late at night, you know, if you really want to wake up early and you don't go to sleep early in the morning, I mean sleep early at night, you're not going to have any energy. You know, you just wake up and you just like, you know, do everything and you just rush out the door. You never have the time, right? So even the deciding, you know, getting the right place, the right time so that my heart can settle and I'd be able to worship, I'd be able to be in the Word, and I'd be able to reflect upon His Word and meeting with Him. You, you know, without that, your relationship with God would be like, you know, wake up just like with you know, a teenager living in the house with mom and dad, you know, just chow out some breakfast. Hi, mom. Bye, mom. Out the door. How are you going to get some sort of relationship? How are you going to get deep? You can't, right? So you must get down. You need to bow down. Get yourself into a position before you worship. Now, secondly, you see that they also opened that treasure and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh, right? So you treasure by your own treasures, right? So if you really, really think that this person or this baby is like really, really great, you want to basically show your affection, you do that by gifts, right? So the Magi did it. Gold is represented for the kingship, right? And then the frankincense is the kind of uh, uh, incense that they use in temples that, that represent his divine, uh, his divinity. And then myrrh is the uh, perfume that they use to embody, you know, during burial. So that represents his humanity. So that gifts mean something. But no matter what, you can really see that these are the rare treasures. Not everybody can have. So we bring the best out for them. So I think in the same way, every Christmas, we are reminded to give our beholding of our king through our treasure. You have you know, Project Hopes. Uh, in our church, we also have a charity giving and we'll do matching gifts, so give to charity, something that we will we'll give, right? But I think beyond this, some of you say, well, you know, I, I don't really have you know, loaded with money but then you can also have time and have talents that you can give. Sometimes it's much easier for us to just give money. But it's much, much harder for us to give our time. Right? Spending time with people, knowing where they are, understand the flight of the oppressed, of the lonely, of the, you know, the people who despair. A lot of time, we don't really have that time that we can be able to spend. So give that a treasure to our king. Now, some people also begin to do giving, you know, 
time and money, and they do this in a way. In the picture you can see there on the right is Bonnie, uh, the wife of Pastor Brendan Lee, and she partnered with us. So uh, in our church, we are. this is our mission team. In February, we'll go to Vietnam for a medical mission. Uh, they, they spend time, they raise money, and I think part of your giving to Bonnie is also help with that, right? So we, together, we can care for, for other people and express um, that worshiping of our king. Now, thirdly, the Bible said that after they met Jesus, right, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod and return to the country by another route. So what I see here is in order to worship God, behold our king, you also need to get back by a different way. What do I mean by this? Right, so it actually not very convenient to trying to go back to a new way. Right, so many times, for those of you who commute, you know, sometimes you actually can go from one A to one point B and going back home, you don't even think about it, right? Because so you're so used to it, it's easy. But then every time that you try something new, it's harder. So here, what they have is like, well, you know, it's harder. But not only that, they also express the idea of obedience as well. Remember when the Magi set out, when they came, they see King Herod. So King Herod begins like, okay, so yeah, here's the location, Bethlehem. So when you go, come back and we will worship him too. But now when they begin to come and encounter King Jesus, King Jesus actually have a different order. He said, nope, you don't go back to King Herod. Who is your king? King Herod or King Jesus? When you worship the king, when you pay homage to the king, when you behold your king, it also requires an attitude of obedience and submission to the king. You cannot say, yeah, I'm going to, you know, you are my king, and then you go back and obey King Herod, right? So I think the way that we do the same way, a lot of us, we come to church on Sunday, we come and we worship God, we, play, uh, we give honor to God, and then we go back to our life, you know, Monday through, you know, Saturday, doing our own things, doing all these things, right? But then in terms of obedience, do we actively obey in God, not only on Sunday, but also in our daily lives? And in daily lives, actually, where the rubber meets the road, right? You know, on Sunday, when you meet with people, everybody pretty nice, you know, hi, how are you, and I'm fine, I'm good. But then at home is where a teenager would talk back to their mom, you know, husband and wife get into a fight. At work, people are cheating on you, they oppress you, they, you know, mistreat you and stuff. So how are you going to do this? Who are you going to obey on your Monday through Saturday, right? So the Bible actually says that, what you do at home in daily life would be the worship, the right worship. Romans 12 said, you know, brother and sister, we offer our body as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of King Herod, but be transformed by King Jesus. Right? So I think that's what we are challenged to do. So how does that work, look like? In our church, recently, we go through a study in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we have these little group texts where people would be texting, reminder daily, you know, reading, and also applying. And so the challenge, the daily challenge, one of the last daily challenge was from the last chapter, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, said that do everything with love. So we challenge people, okay, so... Begin to think ahead about the next 24 hours, your mundane daily living. And then imagine in your head, decide to see how would what you do would look like with love. And one of my young men, you know, one of the young men share back to the group text, say, well, so I think through this and uh, I decide to commute in love. So what do you mean by Commute in love, you know, driving in love. So, so I'm, I'm actually, so what happened is that when I go in gridlock traffic under 405, you know, people cut me off and people were like honking, you know, flipping the bird and all these crazy stuff. 
And I remember that love is patient, that love is kind. So instead of basically honking them back or you know give them the bird back and stuff, I'm really kind of you know practicing my patience and obeying Jesus and showing my love through my driving. If people want to cut in, I will slow down, let them go ahead. This is the kind of offering, of honoring God, of beholding our King in our life and our action daily, right? But then one thing that we also have to ask about, sometimes we get sick and tired of, you know, oh, why do I have to basically do an all the good deeds all the time? Why do I have to follow King Jesus? Why do I have to behold your King? Why do I have to do this? After all, Jesus already died for my sin. Even if I don't, you know, do anything, you know, I shouldn't, he already saved me and forgive my sin, I'll go to heaven anyway. I think one of the things that we need to remember is this. The reason that we behold our king, the reason that we also follow our king footsteps, to love one another, to live out the gospel, is because he have demonstrated first for us. There was a poem, very short poem, by R.S. Thomas. It talked about this idea of what Jesus had done. How he actually had made not only a thousand mile track, but a long, long track from heaven to earth for us. And I would invite you to watch and reflect upon these short poems so that your heart also be moved so that you can also be able to behold our King.